after a psychedelic dark age that spanned decades. The realm of psychedelic science is finally experiencing a renaissance, shedding light on the incredible potential of psilocybin containing mushrooms to transform our understanding of the mind, consciousness, and our mental and spiritual health. If we as a community are going to grow and evolve, we must bring something to the scientific table. We must think beyond ourselves and work to contribute to the psychedelic renaissance in a meaningful way. But why, you may ask, is it so vital to explore the intricacies of these tryptamine alkaloids and in particular the cultivation techniques that give us access to these precious compounds? The answer lies at the heart of the underground cultivation community, where seekers and researchers are on a quest to unveil the full spectrum of psychedelic experiences and therapeutic potential hidden within these mushrooms. But there is much work to be done. While there are over 120 species of mushrooms that contain psilocybin and other tryptamine alkaloids, the vast majority of home cultivators grow a single species. Many of these psilocybin-containing species have never been cultivated. What special properties and therapeutic effects might these other species contain? We have yet to find out, but the very first step is to focus on their cultivation. I found a special outdoor cultivator who is on the cutting edge for growing Psilocybe zapticorum, one of the most potent psilocybin containing mushrooms. His approach to growing outdoors has been evolved over the past 10 years. And tonight he's going to share his secrets to outdoor cultivation success. Stay tuned for an unforgettable episode full of tips, tricks, and secrets that just may help us all become better cultivators and better people. You're listening to the Myco Geeky Podcast, a podcast that inspires people to grow mushrooms at home to improve their mental, emotional, and physical health. Most people call him geeky, and he is a passionate mushroom cultivator advocate and educator every week he sits down with fellow cultivators mushroom educators scientists and therapists to discuss the various ways people can approach mushroom cultivation and how mushrooms can be used to improve their lives all right what's up everybody welcome to the Michael geeky podcast the podcast that goes deep so you can level up your at-home mushroom cultivation game i'm your host Michael geeky and tonight we got a real special episode uh i say that every week i know i like to believe it is tonight i know for a fact it is i have probably not gotten this excited talking to somebody in a really long time um i'm talking about mac ready if you guys are on Facebook, you have probably, and you're in, you know, like wood lovers, uh, Facebook groups, stuff like that. You, you, you might've seen some of this guy's, uh, outdoor grows. They are nothing short of exceptional. Uh, they are definitely getting me excited about growing zaps. I can tell you that, uh, before we get into it with him though, let, I got a little bit of news to cover, uh, right now, as we speak the 2023 fall continental michael blitz is in full effect if you guys are not out uh hiking biking roaming around your neighborhood looking for mushrooms uh what are you waiting for this is an opportunity for everybody to get outside connect with nature find some cool mushrooms you can send 10 of your coolest most precious samples in uh to be uh its sequenced and uh I mean, what are you guys doing? Let's, let's do it. So anyway, I, I'm going to show you a little video here just to get you guys a little excited about it. Imagine being part of an exclusive group of fungi enthusiasts where each discovery you make isn't just a photograph, but a scientifically verified identity. Join the MycoBlitz and get free DNA barcoding for your samples. Step into the future of mycology. Welcome to the second annual Continental MycoBlitz, a continental scale mushroom collecting foray taking North America by storm. This exciting event is more than just a fun outing. It's an opportunity to contribute to our understanding of the mushrooms in North America. Your finds could help uncover new species and expand our knowledge of fungi. Getting involved is simple. Download your collection slips, install the iNaturalist app, join the MycoBlitz project, and you're ready to start your mushroom hunt. Photograph your finds, collect samples, dry them, and mail your top 10 specimens to our processing facilities. With the iNaturalist mobile app, it's never been easier to document and share your discoveries. Whether you're an amateur enthusiast or an experienced mycologist, the Continental MycoBlitz is open to everyone. So let's get out there and start discovering the hidden world of fungi. Join the Continental MycoBlitz and make a significant contribution to our knowledge of North American mushrooms. Join all right, I got that from the Central Texas Mycological Society. Uh, shout out to them. Um, I believe 
I believe that was a repost or, or a remix from uh, something that uh, Mandy Quirk put out on Instagram. So anyway, shout out to Mandy as well. Yeah, guys, I mean, get get out there, find some mushrooms. When else are you going to get an opportunity to have like over $100 worth of DNA sequencing done on, on, uh, on some mushrooms you find? Um, it gives you, uh, also, I feel like it's an opportunity to, uh, if you've not already downloaded iNaturalist, download it to your phone. It's a great way to learn about mushrooms. It's a great way to document, you know, mushrooms that you find out and about when you're hiking, walking your dog, whatever you're doing in the woods, guys. Grab those mushrooms. I already know you guys got the dehydrator, so bring it home, dehydrate them, put them in a Ziploc bags, write the iNat number down and, and get them sequenced. What do you got to lose? All right. And just so you know, this, this idea, this concept, uh, it it's, it's newer. My buddy, Steven Russell, uh, he's been on the show before talking about, uh, DNA sequencing, uh, and why it's important. He is the, uh, mad genius behind this whole project. Uh, his Michael maps, his, uh, my uh, sequencing company, this guy is doing a lot of great stuff for, for mycology right now. Um, and uh, on his website, uh, mycoda.com, I, I found a nice little video I wanted to play real quick just to give you guys uh, a, a taste of what this is all about and, and why, why it's going on. So let me, let me pull this on here. Citizen science is basically non-professionals, however you want to classify them as helping the professionals to conduct research, document mushrooms, where they are, what they are, um, how they're related. The Mycological Society of America and the North American Mycological Association, the professional group and the amateur group, got together several years ago to start the North American Mycoflora Project. NAMA, the national group, is gonna work with the different regions across the country for the local mushroom clubs in the different states. I'm basically one of the people in the Chicago area that's gonna work with the Illinois Club and hopefully also the Wisconsin Club and a little bit with the Indiana Club on how to document mushrooms in our area of the Great Lakes. The idea of the North American mycoflora, it's a very large goal to figure out all the different fungi we have across the continent, Canada, Mexico, US, and that takes a lot of work out in the field collecting and documenting. It's a huge project because we have well over 10,000 different kinds of fungi. Documenting what's out there takes the time of somebody, doesn't matter if professional or amateur, to get out in the woods and find them. Because mushrooms, unlike plants, only come up for a short period of time. You find different species, different years. If you're involved with a club or your local um, university or museum that might have mycologists, just help them out on collecting and documenting the fungi. Specimens are actually the dried collections of the fungi that you find, the mushrooms or polypores or whatever that you find. If you can dry them with just a food dehydrator and document where you found them and when, habitat information, as much location information as you can get, that helps document what you found. A photo only goes so far as it shows us what it looks like, but you can't get DNA out of a photo because you need a specimen to get that data get the DNA sequence, and get the proof that it's a new species. Any time spent out in the woods or whatever habitat you're looking in, looking for mushrooms, you're gonna get new records. It doesn't matter if it's the same location or a different location or a different month, but just repeated observations is what builds up uh, our knowledge of what's there. All right, guys, so 2023 continental myco blitz this is the fall portion so that runs october 13th through the 22nd collect your specimens basically now until the 22nd get them dried get all your your inat stuff figured out so basically it's really simple download inaturalist on your phone set up a little account when you find a mushroom okay here we go here's a mushroom take a picture of it in the ground where you found it i like to take a uh, uh, a view that that shows the area pretty well but still makes it relatively easy to see the mushroom itself or a collection of mushrooms um, then i get a close-up of the cap then i try to get a side view uh, of the mushroom while it's still still uh, sitting there and then i then i pick it and then i get a side view so they get the entire stipe i try to get as much of the 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 base as possible especially if it's an amanita it's important 
Um, and then I get a, a, a nice up close gill shot. I upload all those to INAT. I got the geo coordinates locked in there, you know. Um, so if you're going to be sending in an edible from your honey hole, uh, you know, your little, your go-to log for chicken of the woods or my taki or whatever, you, you know, you, you might want to not send that one in. Plus you already know what that is. So send in something unusual, something you can't identify, um, something that you have an idea of what it is, but you're not exactly sure that that should make it a little bit more fun. Um, they're definitely looking for all the fungal diversity of, of the area. So, um, there's no wrong mus mushroom to submit. Um, but you know, unique is never bad. You know, all, all the myco nerds, we, we like the weird stuff for sure. So anyway, um, we're going to see how that all goes. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll have to have uh, Steve on towards the end of the year and find out how it's going, what's going on. I think we're up to three guys running nanopore at this point. We got, let's see. Well, Michigan, Indiana is, is Steve Kyle's Ohio. And then there's a new guy. I think his name is Garrett. He's in Pennsylvania. So we already got three nanopore people. Midwest is blowing up for nanopore right now. Um, it's very exciting. Uh, and that's all, you know, because it's such an exciting technology. Cannot wait to see where we go with it in the next five years for sure. Also, of course, before we get into the show too much more deeply, let me shout out the Discord mods. Uh, I got a, I got a great Discord. I got great mods. I got great people. Every time I stop in there, try to answer some questions here and there, try to, you know, just, just have a little bit of a presence in there. It's great to see how my wood lovers channels exploded. The pans channels got, you know, a total cult going on in there. They're figuring out how to grow pans on all sorts of different stuff. Um, it's really cool to see uh, all the activity going on in there. So, uh, thank you mods. Thank you. Uh, all the people that are, that are in there playing a role, contributing on a daily basis. Really appreciate you guys. Also shout out, of course, Patreon supporters. That's patreon.com backslash Mike If you guys like the show, please consider supporting it. Uh, the, I don't know, I got 80 some people in there supporting me on a monthly basis. I really appreciate you guys. You guys are absolutely the reason this content uh, is still being delivered on a weekly basis. Uh, man, the demonetization on YouTube is no joke. So it's really, you guys are making it happen. So, uh, love you guys. Appreciate you guys. Stay tuned. Uh, Geeky's got a little something planned next year for, uh, some of the higher tiers. We're going to get, we're going to make it a little more exciting, a little more spicy, if you know what I mean. So, uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, but for right now, you guys are, you guys are the backbone of all this. So I appreciate you guys. All right. Tonight. Can't be more excited. This guy, man, when, when this guy sent me his photos, I'm, I didn't, I was like, nah, man, this is like some AI shit. This is, he, he doctored these photos. This is not even real. Is this guy really doing what he's doing? Anyway, he is, it's crazy. He's awesome. He is a, a, a real cultivator. He is a, a lover of all things cultivation. He, he's out there foraging just like the rest of us. Um, he loves mushrooms that easy and he's got a very uh poignant very uh special story about what really galvanized his love for mushrooms and cultivated cultivation of mushrooms um definitely touched me um i th i think it's gonna it's gonna resonate with a lot of people in here so anyway without further ado let's bring him on to the show all right mac ready live and in the flesh uh what's up man i'm so glad to have you here Hey, dude, how's it going? Uh, well, talking to you, so I don't know if it can get much better. I I'm going to tell everybody watching, um, I, despite uh, hanging out on Facebook and Instagram and all the little socials and all that and talking to a lot of people who grow mushrooms, um, I don't think you hit my radar until I'm down in Mexico. I make friends with this guy, Aaron. And we're chit chatting one day and he goes, Oh, and this is like, I think second to last day down in Mexico. And he goes, bro, come here. Look at this. Have you seen the flushes? This guy Mac ready has got, and he pulls up this picture and I'm like, he's an alien. He's gotta be a fucking alien. There's no way this guy, what? Anyway. So I was like jaw dropping, amazing looking flushes. And I was like, okay, I got to talk to this guy. I got to beg and plead and pray to God this guy will come on the podcast and talk about zaps. I don't know if I've seen anybody grown better yet. Um, 
So you're doing something right. And hopefully we can learn a few things from you uh, because I think it's a nut that we're just starting to crack. And I think the more people we get really given a, a good old college try on this, the better. Um, yeah, hopefully we can evolve these techs and approaches and crack the nut completely. And, you know, it'll just be another exotic that we're growing. So really appreciate uh, you hitting my radar. Glad to have you here. Um, why don't you do this? Uh, we always, we want to know everybody's first mushroom memory. You know, what's your like myco origin story. So kind of walk us through the beginning to where you are now. Um, yeah, it's a pretty long story and has some breaks in between. Um, as far as first impression I ever had that really rocked my world was uh, eating mushrooms uh, at a friend's house and um, going for a walk in a blizzard by myself. And uh, just really starting to realize how important life is and how amazing life is. Um, and that was at a, at a period in my life where I didn't really feel or have that kind of connection. Uh, mushrooms kind of shook me up out of my, my foggy state of mind. But... Um, after that, it was years until I fell um, back into mushrooms again. It was probably about five years or so. And uh, a friend introduced me into medicinal mushrooms and chaga, uh, mushrooms used for, for health. And uh, I'm super interested in, in chaga because of other reasons. Father passing away from cancer. Uh, before he passed away, I was I was looking into what what in the fuck can we do to to help prevent him from passing away. Right, and, uh, mushrooms were, were on that list of things, and I was also you know was intrigued. You could go in the woods and be be alone and find all these. Uh, it's wonderful. Thanks. Sorry, I can't. <laughs> You're it, man. I get it. It you know, when I ask people their first mushroom memory, sometimes it's a simple story. Sometimes it's like a life changing, major, pivotal moment. I get it. I, I'm. It, it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Just simply the that. I can't tell you how many times people have said things like. Yeah, I just realized like life's amazing. Everything's amazing. We're all connected. I mean, these are these profound experiences and, and you have that. And then now you're looking at Chaga, which man, the first time I ever used Chaga, I mean, it like solved half of all my body ailments. <laughs> it was insane. So, uh, and then you dealing with your dad, I mean, God, I can, I can only imagine. Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely the, the beginning to a passion. I, I had no idea that I was going to really follow all mushrooms, not just chaga, turkey tail, and stuff like that. Well, it's how it starts, man, right? Maybe a couple get you in the beginning, and then pretty soon, just start seeing all of them, and they're all amazing, and they all have something special about them, and... You got the bug like everybody else. Yeah, it's it's a bad bug. It doesn't. I haven't been able to shake it. It's we're pushing ten years now, and uh, yeah, it's a crazy up and down type of relationship. That uh, you know, the ups are are what make it worth it, even after you have so much down with it. You know as far as cult cultivating goes and foraging like that's that's another part of my story is i once i found out about chaga i found out about chicken of the woods and of the woods chanterelles and i found somebody um who had a small mushroom farm 
in in a town right next to where I was working in a produce department and she would come deliver mushrooms and I offered to sell her mushrooms. So I started selling her mushrooms. And then when winter came around, I'm like, I don't want to stay working at this uh, produce department. I want to go work on her farm growing mushrooms. And then from that point I went and worked on a gourmet mushroom farm and learned a lot. I bet you did. Managed to grow. And I'm really happy that I got to learn gourmet before I dove into anything anything else because all that stuff is super important. Like learning the grow room is, is very important as far as cultivating goes. But I still, you know, just tons of stuff to learn all the time. Definitely don't. It never ends. It's like every it's like it's like everything. Everything's that way. Right. Everything is that way. I, I will say though, as far as the ups and downs go, um, you know, it's for, uh, one week I'm like, oh my God, I'm fucking great at this. And then the next week, all of a sudden I'm like, am I though? Am I the worst grower of all time? And then two weeks later, I'm like, nope, I'm great. I'm awesome. And it's like a manic, bipolar, crazy relationship. <laughs> but I think for me, I it's when I lose sight of the fact that we're trying to control this thing that, you know, you know, as a forager, the perfect storm of conditions has to happen to cause these fruits to pop up out of the ground. And we're trying to, you know, bend nature to our will and increase the odds and make the big canopies and the full flushes and, and all that stuff. And, you know, sometimes it works out for us and sometimes it, it reminds us that we are not in control like we think we are. That's, that's what I always have to remind myself. It's like, okay having a bad week it's okay let's keep going yeah sometimes it's it's completely out of out of your control and there's nothing you can do about it like that's one thing i think everybody needs to remember is contamination is constantly it's inevitable it's just like at what stage are you getting it and uh how often is it happening for me my contamination thankfully for quite a while now is it's usually just in the latter stages, like it, once it's in the tub. And I think I'm starting to figure out how I can change that. But holy shit, like some sometimes when the, when the light switch goes off and you wasted all this time, you're just like, oh, my God, what the fuck did I just, oh, that was, that was bad. But at least I know it now. And we can yeah, wait till the man. Next, next fucking thing happens. And, and, the, and the more, for me, I don't know. I, I pretty much enjoy all aspects of it. I do not like making substrate. And so, man, when a tub, you know, goes bad or a bag goes bad, my first thought isn't even of the fruits is, God, it took me so long to make that, get that field capacity just right and to pine over all of it. God dang it, why did it contaminate on me? Now yeah. I've been growing in a lot of bags and I'm not, not doing outdoor grows like you. And when it comes to cubes, right, they're not nearly as moist as some of the stuff that you're doing. So I know, you know, the more moisture, the more, more contamination. So I, I, the frustration, you're probably dealing with a little bit more of it than me. Although I will be soon. My, uh, my tent's going to be humidified nonstop for probably the next year or two. So. I'll be dealing with all the cleaning cycles and, and all that fun stuff. Um, it's just get, yeah, it's getting used to that. Even if you're not running a major gourmet mushroom farm or something like that, if this is a serious ongoing hobby, right? Like you become a bit professional about it. You have to, you have to start really, you know, it's like in the beginning, you're like, I would never pay a thousand bucks for a flow hood. Now I'm like, I wouldn't even hesitate. If that thing broke, I would buy another flow hood the next day. Like that thing makes my life a lot easier. End of story. Like just certain things you figure out, you, what you need to enjoy the hobby and, and it, it, it evolves over time. So, um, all right, man. So, uh, so you've been growing 10 years off and on, um, love, hate relationship, mostly love, uh, the, I, I completely feel your pain on that. I appreciate you saying that. I don't think 
I don't think, I think maybe we've lightly touched on that topic before, but, but it's not been talked about so directly. I think it's important. Uh, it doesn't matter how, how good you are or you think you are or how many amazing photos you have. Like it doesn't mean you're still not going to have a little bad zone and get real frustrated. It's just normal. It's part, part of the, part of the process. Yeah, sometimes a bad zone could be a, a three month, you know, fungus gnat fiasco, which I've had happen. And it's it's a it's so it's devastating, but you can you can fix it. You just have to throw it all out. Yeah, you, you, know, you can fix it. You just have to throw literally everything out and yeah, do like a death time sex on this <laughs> stuff. Yes. I, I, I had a period where I could not beat the trick and, uh, I bought an ozone generator. I went, I'm in an open basement. So like, I can only get it so clean. I don't have like a finite room with four walls and a door. Um, and man, I was getting real frustrated for a while. And then I just, you know, tweaked a, a few texts and problem solved. So it's got to hang in there, you know, it, it, it gets solved and you're clearly a testament to that. I think let, let's get in a little bit here. Um, man, these, you, I, I asked Mac ready to send me some photos so we could show some photos off. And, uh, so I expected to get some zap photos. I did not in a million years expect to get the photos I'm about to show you guys. Um, so man, if you're not sitting down, sit down. Um, these are some crazy photos here. All right. So we're going to start. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ease you guys in. We're going to ease in real, real nice. We just, we got some, some basic gourmets here. So I, I'm assuming this is stuff you're, you're growing. You're growing some shants. You're growing, um, lion's mane and shiitake. Or are you harvest, are you foraging the shants? Foraging the shants and the chicken. Um, there's a little, little bitty chicken in there. Um, and uh, growing the lion's mane and the shiitake, I uh, sell to a small farm stamp down the road. They've been awesome. Uh, the people there love the forage stuff and the lion's mane and shiitake oysters and stuff. So enjoy that. I also trade this stuff for some some steak and milk and eggs and stuff. So it's yeah, that's great. Um. First time I, I ate a, a homegrown shiitake, I, I, my life was changed, man. Holy cow. Yeah, they, they are just, a, it's an amazing mushroom. Um, now, I got, uh, speaking of, uh, so we're going to get into this in, in a little bit, but uh, have you ever heard of or have you considered trying to colonize shants yourself anywhere? No, I I Honestly, it was fun. It's funny you say that. I was thinking about trying to clone clone some this year. I just have so many other projects going on, um, and I haven't seen anybody uh, have success with with chanterelles. I haven't looked much into it. I know morales people can do slurries and have like really good success on their property with planting beds, but chanterelles I think are one of those other you know Mother Nature wants to keep it for her own and make us suffer in order to figure out how to do it. But yeah, the, the closest, <laughs> closest I've heard, I heard somebody say they knew a guy, right? So always they know a guy and he had, he would collect them. He would make a slurry and go inject it. He would go to places he had found them before, but didn't find them all the time. And he would either, inject in those areas or try he would try to broaden those areas and that not all of them but some of them like maybe a third of them he would he would see a noticeable difference you know a year or two later so i've i, I got them growing in my backyard I'm, I'm thinking next time i get a flush of them instead of eating them all i'm gonna i'm gonna take some of them try to do the same thing see if i can't strengthen you know just that mycelium in the ground see if that see if it works we'll see all right all right next photo all right what do we got here psilocybin cyanescence uh, cyanescence all right now this is i see some wood chips <clears throat> this is an outdoor grow yeah all right 
talk to me about your your process with, with outdoor grows here. We're going to be looking at quite a few photos. Um, is, is it roughly the same for every species? Do you do, do you tweak a little bit for each one? Uh, for cyanescence, azurescence, and uh, alenii or ovoids, it's all the same. For zapatocorum, I did it a little differently. I added straw to straw and sawdust um, to the to the substrate, and these guys don't have that. So these are just uh, straight sawdust spawn um, spawn to second generation supplemented straw, uh, sawdust spawn. So a little bit of wheat bran. And then that spawned to uh, a wood chip bed with fresh wood chips or uh, wood chips that are about like a week or two old. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you can get dump trucks of wood chips depending on where you live for like a hundred dollars. And you can really go to town with making these outdoor beds. It's just, yeah, it's backbreaking and it takes hours. <laughs> it's fun though. when you get, you know, you get to see what, happens you just have to have a little bit of patience and you then you've just you've colonized the ground right like theoretically especially if you can have that go numerous years in a row you know unless you do something major to that area should should keep popping yeah i would love for ovoids to kind of take over in this like in a more northern region than they are curious if they would wonder what well i'm gonna i'm trying to push the bar from you know southern ohio river valley valley to northeastern ohio and then we'll see if we can't keep pushing it up your way a little bit more and yeah, yeah. well we'll see what what they can actually tolerate well we'll get into um a uh, little bit about uh temperature tolerances i i, I think uh as you mentioned to me before we'll get into it um I bet a lot of these species that we have these like ranges of temperature, um, you know, just because that's where we're finding them, that probably doesn't always mean it's not possible to push those parameters a little bit. So who knows? Who knows? All right. Next I mean, slide. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy, though, because those those will come back year after year as long as you keep feeding them. But they won't like they won't go off and start their own patches like the like they would out in Washington or something, you know, they'll keep spreading around. Just a little less prime, you know, and all that yeah. loam and just the ground out in the Pacific Northwest is, it's a whole nother beast. So it's yeah. a different, different ground. So when you say feed this bed, you mean just like toss a few extra wood chips occasionally, or do you mean additional grain supplement or grain spawn? Uh, wood chips. And I would do, you know, every every springtime add you know uh four to five inches of wood chips on top you could make yeah, you could mix them in a little bit before or like put like a couple a couple inches on top ruffle it up mix it up and then top it off with like five inches of all right so you, you do like the pseudo it's like a pseudo wood chip casing basically yeah all right. All right, and cool. uh, you do that in the in the springtime and in the fall. That way, it's it's never really running out of food, and you're not overfeeding it in the summertime. Because if you do that, then you might not get fruits in the fall. Okay. Now I got a question. Um, do you ever start these beds in the fall, or do you always start them in the spring? Uh, so far, I haven't really started the beds. I, I usually start them in the spring, actually. Yeah, that's what I meant to say. I'll, I'll start all the spawn in the middle of winter when uh, I have time to do those extra projects instead of working out in the garden and stuff outside. But yeah, if, if I, I, I only today. ask because I got a bunch of ovoid uh, masters mix blocks and I had them mixed up thinking I was going to get them in some beds this summer. And I didn't. And so I'm like, well, so what do I do? Do I use these? Do I like, give oh, them dude, I would put, 
I would make a bed with it right away, and I, I bet you in the springtime you'd probably see something. They're really aggressive. I'm hoping that my I made an overwood bed this spring, and I'm hoping this fall something will happen. But I know springtime will be crazy. But I just had this small patch that, that I've been moving around forever, and like every little tiny wood chip. I checked this patch that had like three wood chips on the ground, and there was mushrooms growing off of them. <laughs> Super impressed. With the ovoids. Right, I got tr I got a trust in the ovoids. Yes. All right. Now, now here we're we're gonna jump the gun a little bit, but uh, this this is a photo taken directly from Veracruz, Mexico, right? No, that's uh, that's Conway, Massachusetts. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So so this is outdoor zap grow. Yes. All right, Mac Ready in the house right here doing it. I mean, look at these things. These are these aren't these weird white and yellow. I mean, I'm I'm not trying to I'm not poo-pooing white and yellow zaps. I'll take any old zaps any day of the week. But these look very natural. They they clearly n like being outside. They 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 like where they're at. So is this um is this a new grow? Is this an older grow? That was my first one four and a half years ago. First one four and a half. All right, so you've you've been working zaps off and on for four and a half years. Fantastic. Great. Teach us all your secrets, dude. We're, we 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 got we got to keep it going. All right. So what did you do for this first grow? That was a straight sawdust spawn spawn to potting soil. It was a complete. Uh, Not like it, it was definitely not a professional move. It was me just trying to get. <clears throat> I I didn't know what to do with the spawn at the time. I knew that I really wanted to grow zaps. Uh, after seeing um, some photographs that Alan Rockefeller had taken down in Mexico, I fell in love with them, and uh, I got some spore prints from Alan, and uh, put them to agar, then put them to straight sawdust. And then at that point, I, I couldn't find anything that made any sense. Even the stuff on the shroomery was, um, it seemed like, it, I don't know. I just wanted to try something different, um, but I didn't, I didn't quite know what to do. So I just tossed this bag of sawdust, mixed it in with the potting soil, threw some pine needles and dirt on it, and just crossed my fingers, I guess. Okay, so how long from the time you cross your fingers to that are we are we talking about? It's funny. Uh, I think I did it in a late May. I, I put that out in the yard, and then I went on um, the Food of the Gods tour with Baba Palindi and ate ate the uh, zapatocorum. Ate a lot of zapatocorum. In a mushroom ceremony, it was one of the most intense mushroom experiences I've ever had in my life. It was crazy, but then I, after that whole experience, I came back, like, wondering um, what the fuck just happened. And then I look in the backyard, <laughs> look in the backyard, and I'm like, oh my god, it's still here. Like, the Mexico trip kind of came with me when I came home from mexico these were in the backyard and i was what? just i kept i kept eating them <laughs> right. yeah it was it was really cool the way it all worked out but yeah. also it didn't make sense and i i wouldn't recommend people taking a bag of sawdust spawn and you know tossing it into some potting soil in the yard it, it may work but i don't i don't recommend it and i think it cool only works it. when you access the 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 god had directly through a zap experience in mexico that yeah. then then they 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 literally zap your zaps and and you come home and you, and you have some treats exactly yeah. now so it's interesting though that you did this because um there is a cultivation paper i'm gonna pull this up here and let me get to the right uh so this is this paper um shout out to jordan jacobs um 
who I think is who was mentioning this paper um, somewhere. He, um, so this is from 2008, um, characterization, cultivation of Psilocybe berea, or berea, I don't know, you know, I don't speak Latin. Um, so this, this is essentially, I guess, a, an older name for zaps. But anyway, let me show you these pictures at the end. So these are, you know, lab cultivated zaps. They figured it out. But this is what's interesting to me. They, they did five different uh, um, substrates for them. And they tried peat moss. They said poor, poor mycelial colonization vermin compost pour, compost pour, sand pour, but sand plus compost was good. And that was the only thing that flushed for them. And the, the compost was just organic uh, fruit and vegetable matter um, and waste. And so I, the minute I'm hearing you say that, I'm thinking about this paper. All right, sorry, I, let me just pull that paper off here. Um, I'm sitting there going, oh, okay. So he kind of did that though, right? He just had the sawdust spawn in some compost. Maybe had some sand in it. I don't know. So so maybe maybe there's something to the compost. I don't know. Um, now I, I know your flushes that you did um, didn't necessarily need that, but anyway, just wa I wanted to bring that up. Okay, let's pull the, pull the pictures back here. All right, so this is your first nonchalant zap grow this is how you know you're meant to grow zaps dude is when you just you're sitting on some spawn and you're like what the hell am i supposed to do with this i haven't figured the next part out yet uh screw it i'm just gonna throw in some potting <laughs> soil uh because that's all i have sitting in the garage and you go on a trip to mexico trip balls <laughs> on zaps and you come home to zaps that's that's how you know you're supposed to be doing this yeah man that, that day we it was five me five meo DMT for breakfast, and then a thirty gra thirty gram mushroom trip for dinner. Not even uh, kidding. Only thirty. Only thirty. Well, thirty wet. I'm assuming. Uh, no, more than that. It was like a huge tea, and then a oh, hand, wow. two handfuls, two handfuls, like not small amounts of wow. zap, like full nice. wow, DMT mushroom trip. Okay. As far as as far as you can go, I guess. That's what go big or go home. Go I mean, further. right? Vince <laughs> McKenna. His, yeah. his his museum dose was ten, so uh yeah. Uh, yeah, have you uh, have you listened to any Baba Kalindi's lectures? I have not, no. You should probably totally check him out. He's uh he's the macrodose guy and he's he's uh He's a very fascinating person to listen to. Uh, oh, I, I will. Because I've listened to all yeah. the Terrence stuff like 100 times at this point. So, yeah, let if me. If you like Terrence, you'll, you'll like Bubba. Nice. All right. So here, so more, more, more zaps from that first grow. All right. Now this is, you know, back to my territory. Um, what do we got here? At first I thought this was toke, but obviously this is not toke. What is this? It's a heteroclase of. Mac TP, Ape Kings, three three eight Ape. Okay. Those are some the the three in the bottom left, man. Those are like some seriously unique fruits that like hot tub sitting in the middle of the cap there. That's that's very cool. Yeah, yeah I had one that was uh, that looked very similar to that. That weighed uh, seven hundred and two grams fresh yeah it was wow. nice it was wow i think it was my biggest i want to get i want to get the record on that too but <laughs> that's gonna take i mean time. for well, <laughs> that's a great thing about doing your own crosses is that everything you grow is, is the record for that one because you're the only one who's got it till you that's start look at it that way yeah <laughs> but yeah you you blew the 338 out of the water clearly I mean, it, the, these ones in the front are so big, even some of these others in the back that are still real solid fruits. I mean, they just look small. All right, so this is a ghetto cross, Mac TP, or Mel Mac TP with uh, 8338. Okay, cool. And then this is this. That's that's the same. The, the same. same. 
Yeah, it's just throwing out all these different uh... totally different phenos. Yeah. 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 That. Um. Been... But you know, this morphology, the real, the, I don't even know what you want to call it, kind of electricy kind of margin. Um, uh, some of the Ape King Kong stuff I've seen similar morphology, so I definitely see the the three three eight in there. That's very cool. All right, and then is this is your the TP? It's all, all TP, you know. Okay, cool. And uh, man, when I first saw this picture, I was like, "Is Mac ready growing mushrooms and patio pickers out in his backyard?" But no, you. So you bring. You told me you you bring them from from inside to outside just to harvest. And okay, I yeah. was like. I was like, I got two patio pickers in the back. Maybe I'm gonna give this a try. I mean, that that could work too. Yeah, you definitely could. I think I might need to try. We might need to yeah. FAFO on that one. All right. So, and then this, this is this in a is this a bunch of bags in a tub or just bags sitting on the ground? Bags sitting on the ground. Okay. All right. Looking great. And then this is that same fruit from before just dried yes that's it. okay it's very cool those are one of the ones do you ever get them where you dry them and you're like man i wish i could just like put this under a glass you know display container yeah, like some sort of, or something yeah you want to just what like are, what do those some... guys do with the tables and stuff yeah, just... yeah i feel like you could you just eventually i feel like if there was one little thing in there it would just eventually get weird All right, this is definitely not a cube. Um, grown on a block. Uh, this is um, indoor or outdoor lion's mane? Outdoor lion's mane, just okay. uh, whatever whatever rain we got, and then using a hose and uh, keeping it in a shady spot in the yard. We can get some really nice lion's mane fruits. Um, now, you were telling me... Yeah, you were telling me these are pretty contam or pretty bug resistant. I don't know about contam resistant, but um, I, I did not know that. It does make sense though, because um, they get in nature they just get these sometimes massive heads on them, you know, and they they often just look perfect. So I did not know that 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 bugs tend to stay away from them. Yeah, I mean, compared to compared to oysters, they're it's. Night day. The oysters around here, we get like tons of bugs. And oh, yeah. I had this situation where I sold some oysters to the farm stand and freaked my buddy out. He was actually eating mushrooms. Um, he was all weirded out because he came up to a bin and there was maggots in this bin and he thought he was, mm. thought his mom was slipping. But it was just the oysters. They, <laughs> The oysters just rot so fast unless you're growing them inside. Oh There's no yeah. bugs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we just so we were out foraging last weekend, a uh, bunch of the local dudes, and uh, we found what we thought were just the most perfect, fresh flush of brick cat mushrooms. And somebody made the comment of, oh, we're so lucky. You know, usually these get buggy real fast. And then no more than a couple people get down on their knees to start harvesting these things than just every single one of them already buggy. Like even though they look great on top, underneath already fully infested. So yeah, some some of them softer mushrooms, the, the bugs do not waste any time. They must smell them a mile away. Yeah. All right, now what do we got here? That's a Eleni, so let's be Eleni. Okay, nice. Oh, anyway. yeah. yeah. Shout out to uh old uh John Allen. Um he's on Facebook and um it's real trippy, man. Like you'll you'll do a post about something and then freaking John Allen's like commenting on your post. Like it's very cool. Social yeah, media, yeah. it's it's bad, but it's also got you know some silver linings. Yeah, it's it's definitely have him to right yeah. yeah and then you'll you'll do a post and you'll you'll talk about something and then all of a sudden he'll have 19 photos from 
you know, 1974 of the 19 times he was in Malaysia and Laos and Vietnam. And here's John riding on an elephant and here's John chasing a cheetah down. And you know, I'm like, dude, this guy, I, I someone's got to do a movie on this guy. Somebody's got to write a book or something because this guy's done so many cool things. And here's his mushroom. He got a mushroom. I, I think that's fantastic. And thank God he got a psychoactive mushroom. Very cool. All right. Now, you, you growing cubes outside? No, nope, these are natalensis. Uh, natalensis? All right. Okay. Um, God dang. I mean... Okay, so clearly you solved the fresh air exchange problem here with these because, I mean, my, my gnats never look like this. The caps on these are outrageous, dude. Yeah, the I noticed immediately something wrong with growing gnats indoors when I first started them. The overlay or whatever that is that happens inside i was like oh my god i got one little spaghetti noodle that came out of a, <laughs> out of a whole tub and I'm like, there's something fucking wrong with this i had all this spawn and i'm like well i'm gonna try to see what it does outside because looking at images of it um i think in the one of stamets books just that one little it's not a very great picture but i figured that if they're they're grown outside, they'll probably do a lot better than whatever was going on inside. And I was actually right about it. And, uh, oh, really you were right. Holy cow. <laughs> you got now I'm like, oh, I didn't know I need to grow gnats outside, but I guess I do. Yeah, I only do them seasonally now. I only do them outside. I don't even bother trying to do them inside. Um, just because they're they're not as important. I mean they're very important, but they're not as like uh potent as some of the other ones that I want to try inside. So having them in a grow room inside, I feel like would be kind of a waste of space in my situation, but some people get decent stuff inside. I just decent. Yeah. 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 Nothing like this. Dear God, nothing like this now. So let me ask you, did you do the, so did you spawn these outside in the spring or do you do these a little bit late spring? Like how do you time these? They they can withstand some cold cold nights. So I'll start with these. I'll start with these like the the last week of May, and I'll keep spawning until I bet if I spawned two weeks ago, I'd get some fruits, um, or I would have had some fruits popping right now. They're they're pretty quick when they're outside, and you're taking care of them, making sure they don't dry out. These are good with just. A watering can just go and water them. And and, and so now you added. Sorry, I'm like uh, I'm writing down because I'm gonna do this. So I'm, I'm writing down when I should do this. Um. So did you add like is the grass naturally occurring there? Did you add grass seed? What did you do with this? Just for just for um, aesthetics, I wanted to see what it looked like with grass seed. So I added grass seed to the casing layer after I spawned the bed, and. uh it all grew pretty much at the same time. They all pinned and the grass started growing. And it looks cool. It probably helps pr promote a little microclimate. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, it's a real bitch to clean. I'll tell you. That. <laughs> I, I prefer doing it without the grass seeds, um, but it is fun. I, it is definitely fun. Okay. So maybe I don't, maybe I'll try it without the grass seed first. We'll, we'll see. All right, and so you literally just you just water these things, just keep them moist. Yeah, and you know, as much shade as possible. I would say you can get some sun, like an hour of sun or two hours of sun. But, I but yeah, but not. Yeah, no chlorophyll. They don't need the sun. Although the grass, despite the lack of sun, still seem to do all right. All right, and what do we got here? Uh, just some tamponensis that uh, okay. outside. I 
harvested the truffles. They were in bags, and then I just spun that outside to mm. coir and berm. And nice. uh, fortunately, I couldn't find the better pictures. Some of the caps on those opened up really nice. Camps are people are doing some really nice stuff with those oh, these yeah. days too. It's very nice to see. And Man, so you, you just too. grow everything outside. You just all right. Yeah. More. Those are grown in, in the outdoor tunnel tent. And okay. those are also natalenses. All right. Just a couple. Just a couple yeah, nets out yeah. there. Yeah. All right. So you, you do the, I know Gary Hefferly is working on some of these. And a couple of the gourmet guys like these little tunnel tents, like little mini, like pseudo greenhouse environments. So you like that too? Shelters, uh, the fruit from wind. They don't get too much, you know, air exchange so they don't dry out, um, you know, sun and all that. So um, what all do you grow in those tunnel tents? What else do I grow on those? Yeah, like do you just do the gnats or are there other strains or species um, that you grow? So the idea with my tunnel tent this year, the whole reason behind it was to use it as like a graveyard to get some better second flushes without taking up tub space and stuff. But it also has turned into my zap space. And now I'm putting some ovoid uh, stuff in there, or I did a, a couple of weeks ago. I'm going to try and see if I can push any ovoids out in the ultrasonic mister. So it's like almost like being outside, but it has an ultrasonic mister going with the, the fan taking fresh air um, from one end to the to the other end, and uh, but it's constantly getting getting ultra uh, getting the mist on it. So, but then you have to deal with you have to deal with the high high temperatures in the summer. I don't think that that's good for anything really. Maybe you get away with some pans in that type of situation, but it's not too long. Of, uh, you know. So you kind of have windows where you're you're using those during certain times, but not in like the dead of summer. Yeah, dead of summers. It's, it's, it's just too hot. It's a greenhouse. Yeah, yeah. just gets too yeah. hot. But it is it is shaded. It's shaded very well. It's like literally under under all these trees. So if you're gonna do a grow tunnel, I wouldn't do it like out in your open in the middle of your yard. I would try if you have any woods in here doing the woods or do it by the wood yeah i know it's way easier said than done but uh, yeah it definitely easier said than done but uh, it's okay look at here i mean what do you do you just uh you just milled up some some felled trees and you're just doing straight up ground tech here that's just raised bed <laughs> cube cube garden yeah. you got here yep <laughs> yep yeah the great Mac Reddy's oh, gonna be like a 98 year old grandfather. He's gonna be like, "Come here, kids! Come <laughs> help me harvest my cubes!" Uh, <laughs> God dang, dude! This, plan, some of these pictures are just surreal, but I'm I'm liking seeing them because since uh, I brought this up one night in Mexico, um, I was talking to this guy Victor, and I said, "You know what the world needs? The world needs a fungal zoo." We need like a fungal yeah. zoo. There needs to be a freaking zoo That's you can go to. Yeah, man, I like that. I want it. Well, you're doing it, dude. You're basically, you know, you're you're laying the groundwork here. You know, watching somebody do this kind of stuff, or you see some of those uh, YouTube videos, or there's a couple Instagram accounts where you know some of these guys just get all the most, you know, sexy looking fungus videos you can find and some of these like really well thought out cultivated um you know it'd be like mycorrhizal uh you know ganoderma farms or i don't know i can't even think of all the the different things i've seen but like they really get it dialed in usually for one species um but boy wouldn't it be cool if you could go to a place and you know just have all these cultivated beds that get maintained through, you know, various methods and um, just get to see a lot of mushrooms. I think that'd be cool. 
just like this, just like the back, just like your backyard, Mac Ready. All right. So before you go on, what what are these guys? I thought they were Tidal Wave or Louis uh, Louis Vuitton, but no. What did you say these were? These are Melmac TP. The Melmac TP. Okay, just in the ground. Yeah. All right, and then just some good old fashioned golden oysters, looking spectacular. Yeah. Now. So, did you grow these indoors but took the picture outdoors, or did you grow these outside? I grew them straight outside. Okay. Um, those those love it uh, early spring, and then uh, they love it in the fall too. Yeah. Yeah. Especially where I'm at, uh, they like cooler, but not mm -hmm. too cool temps. And uh, yeah. Just, yeah, that's a like fantastic great. flush right there. Gives and then you what to eat too. Oh, God, yeah. Um, my problem with oysters, though, they're really, once you figure them out, they're not that hard to grow, and then all of a sudden they flush, and you're like, what the hell am I going to do with all these oysters? It's just, even if, yeah. it, it seems like you're not growing a lot, but you're growing a lot. And I'm I'm not really one for, I'm not going to, like, dry and reconstitute oyster mushrooms or anything like that. So I just eat what I can and then give away and go, okay, I'm not going to grow oysters for a while. Although I say that, and then I'm I'm growing. I found we had a, a dying uh, hickory tree in our backyard that had some nice uh, white summer oysters growing on them, and and I I grabbed a clone off of that, and I'm I'm growing them in, in my tent here before I start running the zaps. So I say I don't grow them, but uh, you know, you know, little projects you got got get all these little projects going, then you got to see them through. Yeah, but now your shiitake here look amazing. You keep these outside? Yeah, I do. Do all my gourmet stuff outside at the moment, okay. just out of convenience. And uh -huh. yeah, man, that's space. those are some thick flushes for sure. Um, yeah, I guess my first clue maybe they were grown outside is the the leaf debris. Uh, yeah. literally on the top now so speaking we were um we'll get into this when we look at the zaps um but you know these also really as a general rule grow around the block they, they you know a little bit here and there on yeah. the top, but they really like to grow around the block as well don't they so yeah I, I wonder why some do that and some some like the top i mean and then i see in the far back though there's there's like one or two sitting on the very top. But as a general rule, these guys really like to ring around the block. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so, man, I I asked you to come on the show to talk about zaps. That was definitely, you know, that was the dangling carrot in front of my face. I did not know I was going to be talking to somebody who is doing some of the coolest outdoor uh, beds I, I probably I've ever seen. Um, definitely never seen any Natalensis look like that. I can tell you that. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are going to be grabbing their, their gnat cultures going, okay, guess we're taking gnats outside this year. So uh, if anybody who wants to do that comment, you know, in, in the description, we'll, we'll get it going. We're this, this spring, we're going to do some outdoor grows. We're going to bring people on talking about the process. We're going to get everybody excited about just growing in different ways, trying different things. Um, Mac Ruddy is giving us plenty of reasons to try growing fruit outdoors. That's for sure. Uh, man, I, I, I'm super impressed, dude. Lo loving what I'm seeing. All right. So, um, so, so w when did zaps hit your radar? Um, you said you saw a picture from Alan Rockefeller, and that was how long ago? That must have been five, six years ago. I can't quite remember. It was, it was around the same time, or like a year before he started putting out that uh, slow, uh, slow mushrooms in Mexico poster, and he had it signed. Yeah. Okay. So in that that time, that ballpark. All right. So. Um, so maybe five, six years ago, you see one of Alan's, you know, just super drippy, sexy, high resolution photos, and you just instantly fall in love. You get a print, you start working it, you you get, I mean, at, 
I got probably super lucky on on that first uh, outing, but that's you know it's like golf, right? Just when you're ready to quit, you get a get a couple good holes. I don't play golf, but I hear the stories. Um, so I, that definitely was a nice uh, good fortune in the beginning um, to to I imagine keep you going. And now you were kind of telling me you really you really feel like it's only been this year that you're starting to get feel like maybe you're just starting to crack the nut on this. Yeah. Um, I just, yeah, I had, uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think like my first grow was so easy. I thought that, uh, when I went to go and do it again, that it would be, it would, maybe it wouldn't be super successful i but i would yeah there's no way i'm not going to get a mushroom and what ended up happening was i wound up doing like 70 bags of five pound bags of spawn and it all failed i got one mushroom that aborted but it was a disaster this is all now, so like, did you so you did sawdust you did wood chips what did what were your blocks my blocks were sawdust, wheat bran, and sawdust soybean hull. I tried the master's mix to see if that would do anything, but I didn't do it all right. And I had a different culture than my original culture. <clears throat> I had lost my original culture from the first grow and had to get a new culture. And then I got this new culture, and it seemed to be growing exactly the same as the one I had before. Everything seemed fine. I made the spawn. The spawn seemed good. And I went to spawn everything outdoors and that year it wasn't a very wet year and uh i didn't use an ultrasonic mister or anything like that i just let nature uh, do its thing and i i would water things constantly but it still didn't do anything and then this year i think the the tent was the game changer not only the tent but having it outside getting that fresh air from outside not being you know, in this tiny little grow tent or a tub. So I was able to produce, and then the fruits have, haven't gotten as many fruits as I would, would have liked, but the ones I have been getting have been beautiful, and uh, it's been very rewarding, but I also, it's literally just the beginning, and I don't even feel like this has been a success. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's, just, it's, it's the beginning, and I think that, we can go, we can go in a good, like, this is the beginning. This means we can go further. It's just, man, it's been, it's been a crazy ride up until this point. So now let me, let me tell you. So when I got, um, I, when they hit my radar, I heard Jordan went last year to Hiko. He had some prints. I bought a bunch of wild prints from him. I was like, okay, we're gonna, like I, I, the one I was really gunning for was the zap. So, so I, I think I started with three, maybe four, uh, T zero plates, germed them out, transferred the best stuff, did one more transfer to where I got like relatively cleaned up, um, cultures from different spots on the T zero plate. And then I purposely took transfers from those, pretty close to cleaned up uh isolations all the same day at the same time and my whole goal was i wanted to see if i had some standouts as far as mycelial growth rates so i only everything grew about the same except for one and that one was literally about twice as fast so i ran with that one i think i ran with one other that just looked a little bit faster but as i i kept working that one um, it was just so much faster than the others. And, um, so, so I, I, I used a bunch of those plates to spawn those, uh, those blocks. And, uh, I go to Nama, I go to Mexico, I come back and some of the old plates, I still had a few plates in a stack. I had literally four fruits, every plate pinned a, a big old pins and, awesome. and uh, that's and my, awesome. Mind Spirit Contact, he in his tech now that's out, 
you know, he says this was one of his processes was sit on your plates, especially all your different isolations, the ones that pin. Now you have a culture that is proven to fruit, right? Proven to, to create a fruit. So I'm like, okay, this is a yeah. good sign. So I'm, I'm really hoping that one's good. Uh, happy, happy to send that one to you to mess around with as well. Maybe I got lucky and it's a good one. Um, I also got one from this guy, Cape Collected. And that one's looking yeah. solid. It's not looking quite as fast as the the first one I'm working. And then now I just got uh, Yoshi gave everybody those on the Mexico trip uh, a swab set. And so I got that one germinating. And um, and then uh, Mind Spirit Contact gave me a, a print. So I got that one going. So I got four distinct um, lines going. So we'll see how they all go. But I, I'm starting to think they're kind of like pans where, you know, they can all look fine on the plate, but some, some are going to bang and some are not going to. So I'm, I'm wondering if there isn't a little bit of that to this. We got to do a lot of work. There definitely needs to yeah. be more people interested. I'm, I'm really happy to see that there is more people interested now, but I think the more more the better. In the beginning, it's easy to be like, me, 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 I'm going to do all the work, I'm going to get all the credit. And then you start doing all the work and you're like, dear God, no one man can do all this. Like, we we need a yeah. lot of people doing this work. This is a, it's a lot of FAFO. Yeah, <laughs> I can only cool. FAFO so many hours of the day. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that'll be good. And we'll just keep collecting. Um, I, 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 Got another buddy who sourced some some other stuff from totally different guys. And uh, so I think we just keep getting stuff in. We keep working it. We keep seeing what we get. But boy, I tell you what, your first losing that first culture, right? That might have been something kind of special that it just fruited in whatever the hell you threw it in in the ground. Um, so I, I'm also thinking that if I have a particularly nice fruit in a in a decent flush, I'm going to clone that. I'm going to see what that looks like. I, I, I definitely think paying attention to isolating the genetics and, and testing their, their, you know, fruit ability is, is probably a good call. Um, yeah. But, but okay, let, let, let's stop talking about them. Let, let's, we, we've enticed everybody long enough. Let, let's take a look at some, uh, some of your zaps here. All right. These are big boy zaps. You grew these. Yep. I mean, these are... I grew them and I, I I picked them a little too early when I'm starting to realize, but I'm I'm totally okay with it as far as fours go. Right. Um, but I was just so excited and I definitely, you know, have a little taste of them and they've got yeah. the most amazing sour taste and like yep. nature's, nature's sour candy. Yeah, right here, so... So there's these are ones uh, that they found uh, on the side of the road. So yeah, just a little more uh, darkening to everything, um, and they definitely had plenty of spores on them. So yeah, I mean that's half of it is just figuring out all that stuff, right? Now, that's why I got that scope back there. I can, you know, if I got something new I've never run before, some new cultigen. I will grab, I will literally reach under there with a sterile tweezer. I will pluck out a gill. I'll put it in the scope. I'll, I'll look at the spores. Are they popping off the basidia? You, you know, all that stuff that, that definitely, it's a little extra work, but, but it, it's worth it. Yeah. All right. So here is, and now, so are these little clusters growing in cracks in, in this, uh, these cakes? Yeah, yeah, right. And um, they're they're growing under these pieces of a particular cake. Like this whole this is in that in that uh, like that Mister Tunnel. Um, okay. And uh, yeah. So yeah, they they like these little nooks and crannies. That makes sense. All right now, now this though this isn't in the tunnel, right? Is this in, this is no, in a pub in, or? No, that's that's in the same. In tunnel the tunnel too. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I had the I had spawned all the all my zap tubs. February 28th, I spawned my zap tubs and they sat in my house from February 28th all the way until the middle of May. Nothing had happened, no, nothing contaminated, nothing happened. They seemed a little dry, so I put them outside. They sat outside for another two months, nothing happened. Then I had the, the tent built and then I put them in the tent uh, around June and then July, middle of July, I started to see the first, or the beginning of July, I started to see the first pins. They all aborted. Uh, the reason, the, I don't even know why I'm going on and on about this. The reason they're all broken up is because I took them out of the tubs, put them into this tent, and they, they broke into pieces a little bit. And it didn't seem to. Uh, negatively affect them that much. They they still fruited, but it, that's why it looks like shit. <laughs> it looks a little crazy. So you brought them outside after three months. They weren't doing anything. They looked a little dry. You brought them outside. Did you water them while they were outside, or did you just sit them there, do literally nothing with them? You know, whenever it would rain, I would let the lid off the tub and let it, you know, get. Pounded, pounded with rain, and once in a while go through with a watering can and water them again. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't, I didn't keep any micropore tape on my tub, so there would, there would be fresh air getting in there, like a lot of fresh air. They just, it wasn't holding, um, it, it wasn't creating that cloud environment that I prefer to grow in, I, I believe. You know. So. And then here you're taking some prints. Yeah, that was my first attempt at printing these things. It feels so important with these apps. It took me so long and so much work to right. find spore prints. And literally I did this grow and I'm looking around and now, now there people are growing them everywhere. And I'm trading spore prints and swaps right. with people. And yeah. it's just like, holy shit, like this is something... Well, you told me that four years ago when Alan Rockefeller had, I don't know how many prints he did. It was like 50 or 100 or something, and not too many people got their hands on him. So when I right. lost that, I was very saddened, but it was a crazy life, you know, a change in life at that point and lost all my cultures. And uh, thankfully, it was on my mind for so long, like, oh, my God, I can't believe that I didn't get to keep growing them No. Now that I am growing them again, I'm excited to see if I can make it um, better uh, than I did this year. I do think that getting those those really nice looking fruits, you can you're gonna have to do do them outside or have like a really nice uh, warehouse type facility, like right. an actual commercial space to get those like. Yeah, my tent right now is nowhere near a window. I I have half a mind to move it. So right now it's over there, and I have half a mind to move it over here next to one of them little, I got a little basement window that I'm thinking I could, you know, I could port for a vent so that when it does air exchange, you know, on some cycle, it's actually pulling air from outside in. I think you would benefit from that. That yeah. would be really good. Yeah, there's just no, uh, you know, the the air. It's like when you're in your car and you're recycling the same air in the car versus pulling in fresh. You just feel the difference. Um, it, it's got to be better. Yeah. All right, so yeah. now where the hell is yeah. this? This look, you just dumped a cake next to a tree and you got zaps. <laughs> well, that's that's just a little cluster, one of the the cakes, and uh, I'm I'm a nerd with the taking pictures. I'll, I like taking pictures of mushrooms and I just put it next to the, this stump and oh, okay, okay. I, got, I got a couple of laughs from people there, you know. Yeah, man, I'm sitting here going, okay, this guy is just dumping cakes in the woods, getting fruit. God dang it. Well, I, I definitely dumped a lot, a lot of cakes in the woods. <laughs> yeah. All right, here. That's a nice, 
nicer looking picture. Yeah, these are nice. Yeah, and so you're getting, man, you're, you know, some of these are real big. These are wild size for sure. Some big ones. Yeah. And then now, okay, so here, now we're getting into the pictures. These are, these were the first photos I was exposed to that just had me going, who the hell is this guy and how do I get a hold of him? I mean, these, these pictures should, if these don't get you excited to grow these things, then don't, you know, watch another episode because this right here is definitely got me going, okay, this is what I want right here. I mean, just the flaco stems, the, especially these larger cabs just look perfect, man. That. Yeah. All right. So now these cakes. So how long are you colonizing these cakes before you're fruiting them? I mean, next time I do it, um, I'll, I don't know. My next, the next time I'm trying that, this it's going to be inside, so it'll definitely be different. And then next year, I think I'd probably put it into fruiting after like three weeks just put the term you know maybe four just to eyeball it and go with go with your gut and some intuition that's interesting you say that okay so i grabbed a bag here i spawned this bag this is alder wood chips with alder, alder sawdust this was on seven two and i did a break and shake because it was absolutely 100 percent colonized by 727 so that's 25 days. So we're, you know, yeah, not more than three weeks, but not quite four weeks. And so I've been sitting on this. This thing is, I think we're about three months on it. So I probably, it's probably been sitting there a little bit too long, but it's okay. Let's see what happens. Um, so, so you would be inclined to only like once it's colonized, you want to fruit it. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. I think it, it, you probably want it to colonize longer if you're using stuff like wood chips or sawdust. If you're doing, I'm I'm going to give it a go with the koi or vermiculite and just see what happens. But I'm also going to try millet and straw and see what happens. I'm going to try a bunch of different shit. But I, I think if you have like thicker media, like uh, the wood chips. And that's, I think that's why I, it took so much longer for me to get fruits at this round than, um, than what I'm hearing from other people, but maybe it's benefited the, the way they look. I uh, think it's I, benefited the way they look for sure. I, now I know mine spirit told me, he said, so you can, it seems like we're starting to figure out you can grow them on just about any substrate. He said, but in my experience, the biggest fruits are coming from a, a wood source so um we'll find out i'm like you yeah, i want to grow them on a bunch of different things um if yeah. i could figure out a tech yeah, yeah. where they didn't get quite that big but they were filling a tub cool yeah. uh, i'm cool with that too you know but uh, I, I definitely like these really big fruits i i, I definitely want to figure out how to do that as well now, uh, somebody else uh, down in Mexico was saying um, straw. So, yeah, that um, you probably heard the same thing. So, I, I yeah, that's, I some of these some of these uh, cakes here have straw and sawdust. Yeah, so that's. So I, I've been. Oh, I use straw pellets. I use straw pellets and hardwood fuel pellets. It's so much okay. easier to use the straw pellets than to try and uh, chop your own straw. And buy right. Bread. Yeah. Or if you could find chop straw, maybe, but I mean, that's something I'm cool. I'm cool with the pellets. Yeah. In my hand. yeah. Yeah. And then the, nice. the other thing uh, someone was talking to me about was saying all the places that he's finding zaps uh, in Mexico, um, he was pretty certain that the ground was very acidic. So he was like, you know, you might want to start messing around with uh, amending your soil to, or your substrate to, 
you know, lower the pH a little bit, see, see what that does to your fruit. So I'm going to play around with that. Not this first round. This first round, all I'm going to do is do different casing layers. I'm just going to try to figure out if um, there seems to be a, a better casing layer to use than the others. And then round two is going to be about uh, a little bit of amendments and, and stuff like that. Round three, then will be completely different substrates. Yep. A lot of FAFO to do. Yeah. As you very well know. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see some more of these. Okay. This, this actually, this was the very first picture I saw uh, of your zap grows and was instantly convinced I had had to reach out and find you. Yeah. So this, is this one of your more recent grows? Yes. All right. Walk me through this cake. What's in this cake? What'd you do to it? How long did it sit there? Um, did you do something specific before you finally got, got pins and got fruit? Uh, I did, didn't really do much except for bring it into that, that grow environment. Um, this, this cake is sawdust, straw and oats. That was what I used for, um, so my, my first generation spawn, my G1 bags were always 50% sawdust, 50% oats, um, which if I had done uh, just oats, never worked for some reason. But I've been hearing that saps don't like oats um, that much. So I want to try a mixture of things. But I got, I got good results from the oats. I, I I just put a bunch on oats, so okay, hopefully <laughs> hopefully I get somewhere. There's some millet in there too, so I did fifty fifty oats millet. Yeah, so, that'll be good, dude. Okay. No, that'll be good. I mean I, I have no idea really. If what one person can say one thing and then the other person does it and you know, it's just is what it is. But I'm gonna have to try popcorn. I like I like popcorn. I'm going to have to see how it does on popcorn. But all I did for these first bags, these were just, um, I think I did one puck per bag, and it was just the alderwood chips with the alderwood sawdust. There was no ever any grain in these things. It was just wood and, and, and colonized in less than four weeks. So who knows? Maybe, maybe I'm going to find out there's not enough nutrition in there. I hope. That's not the case, but we'll see. But you have always used a grain in addition to whatever wood product. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, yeah, I would, uh, did a, a few experiments, um, but it was mostly G1 spawn 50, 50%. I was 50% sawdust. I would spawn that to uh 50 percent sawdust 50 percent uh straw pellets okay and then i would take that and then spawn that to coir and vermiculite in my tubs and then okay. case it with 50 50 peat moss vermiculite all right but then with some of those or some well no with some of that second generation spawn i would uh or i spawn to wood chips actual wood chips some of the, the mushrooms that i fruited uh zap it from wire fruited on wood chips which i thought was pretty cool i don't remember any doing and then raw wood but actual like thick pieces of wood chips oh very cool I haven't seen that yet but I, I wouldn't recommend people try that i mean i guess i would if you really want to mess around with it but i think it takes a lot longer and if you're looking for fruits right away i would go for something simpler and then play around you right. know i feel like you get that fix and then you want to move like keep it going and see where you can take it but some of the stuff i tried early on i think it just took a lot longer because of all the nutrients i had a ton of aborts for the first flush on a lot of these like literally thousands of aborts to the point where I was like, oh my God, this is it. Like, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be doing mushrooms anymore. I can't uh, take this anymore. <laughs> I can't do the failure. Yes. 
I hear like, you. Oh my God, like you're just like, you're taunting me at this point. I'm not even uh, kidding. Thousands, thousands uh, of pins in your forehead. Man. But, but I mean, you picked them all and ate them, right? <laughs> I ate the ones that I could, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But some of them were so small, it was, it was like, yeah, it was eat. such a, yeah, they were just not even, it wanted to do something. And then it just, uh, then I had to wait another month and then finally got right. these really nice, beautiful mushrooms. And they're continuing to produce right now. Might put them indoors. Let's see if I can write them out. And, and just just for reference, so people know, these grow slow. Yes. Not cubes. They do not grow rapidly. Yeah. You, you got me thinking. I might I might try it your style next because I was just on. The, I got more. Uh, I was gonna sit on uh, some more of this wood chips. Uh, I, I'm going to, the first one I fermented for a month, this one I'm fermenting for three months, but maybe I'll do your process where I'll, I'll run them on, um, sawdust and, and some sort of, uh, grain first and then put them as the second or, or, or third step. We'll see. Yeah. Sawdust, uh, sawdust and grain are, makes for some really nice spawn for a lot of things, not just, uh, Sapinicorms, but ovoids, basically any one lover, like a mixture of grains and then sprinkle in some sawdust or put like 20% sawdust. You get some very nice, uh, nice spawn. I feel like if people, if people followed uh, how commercial cultivators operate and applied it to their, their hobby at home, they could really, you know, push things further and that's what people are doing i think with tents and stuff and di like dialing everything in and, but with the like wood chip beds and outdoor stuff a little, little more climate dependent but yeah i like the idea of the the ultra fine misters um i used those i propagated for a while for uh uh like bonsai seedlings and stuff like that and they're you know i for my little propagation tables, I, I, I use real ultra fine misters and I, I've always been thinking, yeah, I wonder if I, you know, if I did something outdoors, I wonder how hard it would be to set up some, some stakes and just get it on a timer. And, you know, so that way, even if the weather's not cooperating, I can, I can kind of override the weather a little bit. So might have to, might have to give that a try. So the, the other thing, the one thing Sila Vibe said when he came on talking about growing zaps, he said, you know, they, they like to be pretty wet. Um, now going to Veracruz, it's more that they're just, they're in these cloud forests. So it's, it's just like, it's dense humidity. Like, you know, it just literally almost, you can see it sometimes. Um, what are your thoughts as far as that goes? How, how, how wet? Are we trying to keep these things? I mean, I've been keeping a mister on it pretty much 24 hours a day. Um, if I'm ever in there, sometimes I'll turn it off just so I can see. It gets a little spooky in there because you can't see. <laughs> you can't see like four feet in front of you. Um, don't want to trip on anything. Um, so, yeah, so I, yes, very, very wet, very it's very okay. wet but it's also a, a lot of fresh air not just like a, a swamp but like you got to have airflow going through there right. and um i think that that's the tricky part I guess. that's the tricky part how do you <laughs> right yeah yeah that's you know you're okay cool the fogger's making Making humidity and then the fans blowing it away. And uh, Mind Spirit Contact was saying his thoughts. He was convinced that um, temperature, uh, the role of temperature. He his his observation was that the temperature is pretty steady, right? He he said uh, I think you would want to control for swings in temperature. So. One of my struggles is if I were to try to grow outdoors where I live, except for certain times of the summer, I mean, I, we still get a fairly decent temperature swing, you know, from day to night. Like, um, I mean, the temperature swings in 
in Oaxaca are were actually pretty drastic. I I was up on the mountain in San San Jose del Pacifico, and during the day it'd be eighty degrees, and at night it would be fifty. Oh, really? Yeah, and that's where the landslide. So <clears throat> that's where the landslide stuff would happen, and uh, I believe. I don't know for certain, but I believe the first spore print I got may have come from that area, but I don't necessarily know. I think I have to ask if Alan Rockefeller got spore prints from that area. I know he's been there, but but I don't know if he got spore or mushroom prints there. Um, well, that bodes well then, because, yeah, that hearing him say that, I was like, oh, great, well... I think the temperature swing might be a good thing, honestly. Okay. Right? I mean, We're going to find out. That's where I've started to notice uh, more activity going on lately. I've been having colder nights and things are starting to juice up in there and get. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's, I don't know. But I, I remember it being like, I'm, I'm all the way in Mexico and it's, but I was also you know, seven thousand feet up in the air. Yeah. But I was cold at night. It was awesome. It was so nice. It's a very beautiful spot. Oh yeah, we we were never really that hot. Uh, now when we flew into Veracruz, Veracruz was a absolute sauna. I w- have not been that uncomfortable in a very long time. Um, but the minute we got up into Jalapa, Hico, Cuatepec area. It was all good. And then particularly when we were going up higher elevation hiking. Yeah. I mean, it was super temperature was never, never a problem. So, yeah, but I didn't, yeah, I was never there in the middle of the night. So I I didn't know what the temperatures were getting down to, but it didn't where we stayed. It didn't seem like it was getting, you know, like I slept with the windows open and it was very comfortable and never got cool or anything. So I, I, I thought that made sense, but yeah, maybe I'll have to look into it. But either way, for me, if I grow them outside, I can't really do much about the temperature. So yeah, yeah the, the swings will be what they are. Yeah, I think learning how to do it inside is very important. I'm nervous to try it on inside. Just, I don't know. Well, you're you're definitely figuring uh, some stuff out. I mean, look at these pictures; are bonkers, dude. Yeah, and then here's some little guys. Yeah. <laughs> that looks great. Um, now I have to show you uh, some of the other stuff coming up. So. Yeah, man, as, as you as you do stuff, let me know. And then we can always, you know, if some little thing you figure out, um, I, I've been toying around. I'm due for another grow along. So I was toying around with, do I do an exotic? Do I do a wood lover? Are we going to try zaps? Like what what's going to be the the next thing? But um, for sure, if, if you got any little tips or tricks or something you think you got figured out, um, loop me in. Uh, I got a handful of people who are growing them right now. So, um, I got, I got like five guys who are pretty motivated to figure it out too. So the, you know, the posse is growing. We, we can all work together, share knowledge and keep it going, get it figured out. Yeah. Sounds good. And likely it sounds like you don't need any of our help cause you, you're, you're, you're doing just fine, but who knows? One of these guys, this is how I look. Oh, at no, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning from everybody else, too. I'm, I'm going to try things that other people have tried that I haven't tried. You know, I, I yeah. went in, I felt like I was in the dark for a long time. Um, now it's nice to see, you know, what, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what other people can bring. bring I mean, over. look, Jordan and Yoshi came back. Um, you know, they, they swabbed a lot of fruit. They're, you know, making it available for people. So I got to assume you're going to go from feeling like one, you know, a lonely Island in the middle of the ocean to, I think there's going to be a lot of people starting to play with these things. So yeah, maybe that this is going to be the year for zaps. We'll see. It'll be cool. Yeah, it'll be awesome. I think it will be. <laughs> should, should be good. 
Well, man, we'll, we'll have to have you back on uh, in the spring. Uh, you know, we can talk about uh, some some more outdoor stuff and, um, you know, just just kind of peek into what you're up to then and, and all that stuff. But thank you so much for being on. Um, I yeah, thank you. I, I really honestly, when I reached out to you, I was like, nope, this guy, he figured something out. He's not going to tell anybody. He's going to keep it all to himself. And you immediately responded and, and were, you know, nice and all that. So that, that was super great. Very welcome. Really appreciate it. I love you got the same attitude, uh, you know, that I try to promote, which is let's all work together. Let's all get better at growing this stuff. You know, more, the more people doing it, the more little tricks are going to get figured out. So, uh, re really appreciate having you on. Cool. Thank you very much. All right, dude. Um, I will, uh, talk to you again soon until then. Uh, may you have more, uh, more good luck with, with the zaps and all your outdoor growth and, <laughs> and we'll, until next time, uh, you as well. Yeah. Take care. All right, guys, that was the one, the only Mac ready, always ready, killing it outside. Oh my God. Where to begin? Gigi's going to have to get himself some of them little outdoor, uh, little half dome greenhouses. We're going to have to do some misting. We're going to go outside next year, man. Spring, spring is about to get for real over here. I cannot wait. I might have to go to Vermont. I might have to go. I might have to start getting to some of your guys's amazing labs, grow spaces, outdoor beds, you name it. We got to get, we got to see this stuff. We got to just, you guys are all doing so many amazing things. It gets me so excited. I cannot, not enough hours in the day, not enough hours in the day. Anyway, that's the show for tonight. I hope you guys uh, liked it. hope you learned something. Uh, man, if you guys are going to think about uh, growing zaps or you're thinking about growing some stuff outdoors, let me know. I can help make that happen for you guys. We're going to start an outdoor cultivation channel in the Discord, so stay tuned for that. Next week, we're going to shift gears a little bit. You know, we've been doing a lot of the, the outdoor foraging stuff, shifting. We've been doing some, some indoor cultivation for a while. And uh, next week, we're going to shift into the more therapeutic and integration uh, side of things. I got uh, uh, an amazing couple. They're going to come on. Uh, Michael Mama's recommended. Uh, I give these guys, uh, you know, reach out and see if they'd be willing to come on the show. Uh, it's uh, Travis and Wendy Townsend. They are a part of an organization that's like spiritual, uh, therapeutic, you know, counseling, whatever you want to call it. But, but it's a whole different approach. And, and they've been doing that for many years. And then they, they found psychedelics and the way that psychedelics has informed the, the therapeutic work that they're doing with couples and individuals. Um, it was a really profound story. Um, I think you guys are going to re really dig hearing all about it. Um, I, it definitely piqued my interest to the point where I, I'm starting to check it out on a little bit deeper level. So, uh, anyway, stay tuned next week for that. And then, uh, man coming up, we're going to have to talk to the man the myth, the legend, and the brother of an absolute psychedelic psychonauts, uh, you know, not Godhead, but like one of the icons of the psychedelic world, uh, the living legend, Dennis McKenna. Uh, stay tuned. Go only good things from here on out, guys. We're, we're just, I, I, I got it. I'm locked in. I'm on track. No one's derailing this train. It's only just getting going five years from now, 10 years from now. It's going to be mushrooms, mushrooms, mushrooms. Stay tuned.